and I wanted to make money. My dad said, you know, in that life you make money, it translates to power. Not unlike the real world. Since the 1930s, five families have ran New York City's Italian Mafia. The Bonanno, Gambino, Genovese, Lucchese, and Colombo. All across the city, these families went on to control much of the city's unions and make money through extortion, labor rackets, smuggling, loan sharking, and bookmaking. Despite all these methods of making money, it's said that just because you became a made man, that didn't guarantee you'll become a wealthy one. The made men that wanted to become big earners for their families still had to be business savvy and driven to find the best business deals or opportunities. This was showcased within the Colombo family, where there was a member who, at the height of his days, was bringing in eight to ten million dollars a week. Had ten million dollars a week coming into my pocket, and I thought I was invincible. In 1986, at the age of 35, Michael Francis made Fortune magazine's top 50 mafia bosses list, making him the youngest mob member in the list and possibly the richest. Michael Francis was born on May 27, 1951 in Brooklyn, New York to Christina and John Sonny Francis. Michael's father, Sonny, was an instrumental key to him wanting to join the mob later on in his life. Sonny was a very well-respected, old-school demeanor mobster whom Michael had always looked up to. As a number two in the Colombo organization, Sonny was considered a big earner for the family, controlling extortion, bookmaking, and loan sharking operations in Brooklyn, Queens, and on Long Island. He was often seen in company of celebrities like Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., and Frank Sinatra, who on many occasions was seen kissing Sonny's ring in public. Sonny had gotten involved in several legitimate projects to clean up his money. He put up a bulk of the money for the production of an adult film, which went on to gross over $200 million. He also invested in the early Texas Chainsaw Massacre and became a silent partner at Buddha Records. Despite the lifestyle Michael had seen his father live, he never had any intentions to get into the mob. Sonny had made it clear that Michael was to go to school and do everything legitimately. And for a few years, that was the case. Until Sonny was arrested and sentenced to 50 years in prison. At the time, Joe Colombo was the boss of the Colombo family and took Michael under his wing. Concern was expressed by other members of Sonny's prison sentence. So determined, Michael took a trip to visit his father in Leavenworth and discussed his desire to leave his education behind and get into the life his father was involved in. Sonny saw fit to guide his son the correct way and proposed for Michael to become a member of the mob. Michael spent nearly two years as a recruit for the Colombo family, doing anything and everything they'd ask of him to prove his worthiness. My dad asked me, when he proposed me, or was ready to propose me, he asked me one simple question. He said, Michael, if you ever had to kill somebody, could you do it? I thought about it for a minute. And I said, Dad, if the circumstances were right, yes, I believe I could do it. Now again, whenever I was given an order to do anything in that life by my superior, I did it. That's all I'm going to say with respect to that. On Halloween night, 1975, at the age of 24, Michael Francis was inducted into the mob life through a small ceremony. By pricking his finger, mixing his blood with other members, holding a picture of a saint, and taking an oath, the Omerta. I walked into a room, the boss was seated at the head of like a horseshoe configuration, the underboss and the consigliere to his left and right, and all of our capo regimes are captains. And uh, I walked down the aisle, stood in front of the boss, I held out my hand, he took a knife right here, cut my finger. I cupped my hands, he took a picture of a saint, the Catholic altar card, put it on my hands and lit it aflame. And he said, tonight, Michael Francis, you are born again into a new life, into La Cosa Nostra, this thing of ours. Violate what you know about this life, betray your brothers, and you will die and burn in hell like the saint is burning in your hands. Do you accept? Yes, I do. Michael now had two motivations at this point in life. Help his father get out of prison, which he did later on, and most importantly, to make money. At the early start of his mob life, he did what many will resort to doing, Shylocking. Shylocking or loan sharking is when a person offers a loan but with extremely high interest rates. Unlike regular loans, there is no background or credit check requirement, which in those terms sounds like great news for the borrower. But I don't think missing a payment is something you would want to do. And what about union corruption? 
Well, on one occasion, Michael bought union cooperation for a New York condo project. He apparently paid union officials around $400,000 to stay away from the development, thus saving the builders six to eight million dollars in labor costs. With such a large savings gap, Michael was able to pocket a two million dollar fee for general contracting. We control the unions at one time. You control the unions in America, you control the country. That's it. End of story. You know, we had the Teamsters Union, we got two and a half million people working for us. You call a strike, nothing moves in this country. Every truck stops a value. You call a strike at the dock, nothing comes in or out. Done. That's a lot of power. With so much power, Michael was able to form partnerships with legitimate businesses. As money grew, Michael expanded his reach. He would end up owning two car dealerships, several leasing companies, auto repair shops, nightclubs, restaurants, contractor companies, travel agencies, video stores, and distribution companies. But nothing would compare to the business opportunity that came next. In 1981, a man named Larry Ayarizzo had reached out to Michael about a scheme he had going on that defrauded the federal government out of gasoline taxes. Intrigued and curious, Michael decided to test the waters first. I, I put somebody with him because I didn't know him that well. Well, the guy I put with him was a butcher. So this Saturday he pulls up and he's got this big box on his shoulder. And I said, what are you doing with all that meat? Are we having a party or something? I don't know about it. He says, hey, chief, it ain't meat. I said, what is it? He said, come on in the kitchen. We go in the kitchen. He puts the box down. He opens it up, $280,000. He said, that's the first week's take in the gas business. Now working together, the pair set up 18 stock bearer companies based in Panama, where at the time, the law allowed for gasoline to be sold tax-free from one wholesale company to the next. Here's how the entire scheme worked. The one thing you have to keep in mind is that the luxury of the gasoline being allowed to be sold tax-free from one wholesaler to another wholesaler was instrumental to the success of this whole plan. We have four companies, A, B, C, and D, which is the dummy company. First, company A takes in a shipment of say 8,000 gallons of gasoline from a legal wholesaler. This shipment of gasoline happens to be tax-free since company A itself is a wholesaler as well at least is registered as one. Now, on record, company A, the wholesaler, sends the gasoline to company B, C, and D. But this is where it gets interesting. On record, company D is the only company that sells to retailers, you know, your Exxon Mobiles, Shells, Speedways, and others. And since D is selling to retailers, they are responsible for paying the gas tax on that shipment of gasoline. But in reality, company A is the one secretly selling to retailers charging the gas tax and pocketing that gas tax money. However, when it's time for the tax to be collected, company D, the one responsible for the taxes on record, will disappear, leaving nothing to collect, while those in company A pocket the gas tax money completely off record, and the cycle repeats itself. Now, despite whether or not these retailers knew about the shady business moves being made or even cared, it didn't matter. They were being sold gasoline at unbelievable prices since company A wasn't upselling them to make profits. Their profits came straight from the gas tax they charged, which is why this gas scheme at its peak was bringing in $10 million a week. Michael had over 350 gas stations in which he owned, operated, or distributed gasoline to. In fact, this scheme was so successful that members and other families wanted a piece, and all of a sudden, Michael became one of the richest mom members to ever exist. We did the most in that, in that gas business, there's no doubt about it, because everybody came to us. John came to us through Vic Arena and tried to get a piece. Everybody was trying to get a piece of the action. Because of his success, in 1980, Michael was officially made a captain. In the 1980s, Michael was bringing in millions of dollars a week. He had become one of the biggest earners for the mafia since Al Capone. With so much money, he funded new business ventures, like a film production company, Miami Gold, which went on to produce multiple films like Savage Streets, The Gates of Hell, and Knights of the City, where he met his future wife. Michael, now in his 30s, had accomplished what he sought out to do when he first joined the mob. But unfortunately, his lifestyle had finally cut up with him. Recent indictments and prosecutions of the mob leaders is causing an upheaval in the underworld. The FBI says you're a member of the Colombo Mafia family. 
Like I said, the FBI can uh, allege and say whatever they like. They've been doing it for many, many years. In the mid-80s, the Racketeering Law, Bail Reform Act, and the Sentencing Reform Act all changed the playing level field for organized crime. But nothing had the same impact as the RICO Act. Because of it, many members turned informant, many members were put away, and the life that Michael once knew was drastically changing for the worse. Throughout the years, Michael became very familiar with the justice system. Fortunately, he had dodged every single one of his cases until one of his partners turned on him. Unlike Michael, Larry Ayurizzo was not having the same luck with his court procedures. After being apprehended by the feds, Ayurizzo folded and spilled some secrets that affected not only him, but also Michael. Both Ayurizzo and Michael were making millions of dollars from their gas tax scheme and decided to set up a slush account in Austria. In order to retrieve the funds in that account, there was an account number they must submit, which they both split. Ayurizzo had revealed the existence of the account to the feds to help his own case and get a lower sentence. In the meantime, Michael was working on a plea deal and in order for it to work, he was told that he needed to give up his half of the number for the account, which at the moment had a whopping $33 million. On March 21, 1986, Michael pleaded guilty to one count of racketeering conspiracy and one count of tax conspiracy. He took a plea deal where he was sentenced to 10 years in prison and ordered to pay $14.7 million in restitution. During this time in prison, Michael spent 29 months and 7 days in solitary confinement and through reading a bible which was handed to him by a prison guard, he found, or better yet, God found him. In 1994, Michael was released from prison and had decided to renounce his former mob life. But in this life, you don't just walk away from it. Due to his decision, Michael instantly became a big target. His former boss, Carmine Persico, had taken Michael's decision personal, so much so that he put a hit out on him. So at the time, he had moved with his family to California and for the next several years, Michael had to be on a constant lookout for his safety. Years later, since his turnaround from his former life, Michael has gone on to do a great number of things such as becoming a motivational speaker, has written several books in which he covers his former life in the mob, featured in multiple documentaries, and has interviewed with some of the biggest TV networks. On top of that, he even started and grew his own successful YouTube channel, showcasing just how much of an entrepreneur he truly is. At one point, Michael Francis was one of the biggest earners in the mob since Al Capone, making millions of dollars a week. Now, his path lies with him contributing something positive in this world and leaving the past behind. 